Good to see you all. It's my first year that I didn't make the Israel trip with DTS, and I usually am over there once or more a year, and you need to know how fond we are of uh, those who uh, operate the, uh, the garden tomb facility because uh, traveling around and uh, seeing the, the Muslim influence and the Jewish influence and the archaeology and the history, uh, it is an incredible respite to go into the garden tomb facility and hear the gospel uh, clearly presented uh, by their guides every single time. And it's a wonderful way to uh, culminate a great trip in Israel. So uh, God loves you, but we have a wonderful plan for your life, and it's for you to be in Israel sometime, uh, pre preferably at the beginning of your ministry rather than at the end, because it'll change your ministry for a lifetime. But uh, welcome, friends, and uh, thank you for what you do over there. It's a privilege to introduce our speaker, uh, Stephanie Giddens, uh, founded the Vickery Training Company in 2015 after a planned uh, move to Africa with her family uh, got altered and God edited that schedule. But her desire to help the undeserved populations uh, remained stronger than ever. Through her preparation for the move, she gained understanding on how people, or how to help marginalized people, especially from developing nations. So she decided to apply what she had learned to her own country in her own community. Early in her career, she was a, a health specialist for Head Start, giving her experience working with the undeserved and low-income populations. She also co-founded and led the board of directors for Polished, a ministry that serves young professional women, and she worked in the private equity industry as well. That combination of experience and skill helped her prepare her to bring the vision of the Vickery Training Company to life. She's a DFW native. She grew up in Arlington, Texas. It's where I live. Uh, she graduated from Texas A&M, where some of you attended. <laughs> and she received her THM from DTS in 2009. Uh, she now lives in uh, Lake Highlands with her husband, Brad, who is also a DTS grad, and their three children, Campbell, Hutch, and Lincoln. Uh, Brad, would you stand, and Stephanie, would you come, and let's welcome Stephanie Giddens to our chapel this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. So when I was in the THM program, I was the only woman in most of my classes. Um, but there were many men and women here, um, great men and women of the faith, many of which who are in here today and still teaching today that really encouraged me to continue to pursue what the Lord was calling me to do in my life. So after six long years that took me to graduate, I was so excited. I was one of five women in a class of 125 THM students, and I was uh, six months pregnant, so I had this long flowing pregnancy hair and high heels, and I stepped up to the front of the line, and he called my name, Stephen Aaron Giddens. Because it wasn't the norm to have a woman up there in the THM mix of graduates. <laughs> so when I walked across the stage, Dr. Bailey did acknowledge that I'm not a Stephen, and um, handed me my degree, which, by the way, they did print correctly. So DTS, you've come a long way. <laughs> Thank you for continuing to speak or to seek scripture and also um, how to equip all of the saints. And I thank you for the opportunity that you've given me and thousands of other men and women who have come through here to learn scripture and prepare for ministry. So I'm gonna tell you a little story. I'll never forget it. It was six years ago on a Wednesday morning in April. My three-year-old was at preschool. My 11-month-old son was taking his morning nap and I was packing boxes and assembling furniture because that Saturday they were coming to take all of our belongings on a container to Kigali, Rwanda in the heart of East Africa. My husband, Brad, had found a job there with an American-owned consulting firm. We were going to learn the ropes for a couple years and then start our own social business in order to empower and disciple uh, women and help lift them out of poverty. Brad was in Rwanda at the time, and it was his last round of meetings to kick off a new project before we moved there that June. The phone rang, and it was Brad calling from the Kigali airport. I knew immediately something was wrong. The first thing he said to me was, are you going to be mad at me? 
and I knew that our world was about to fall apart. And it did. For the next 36 hours, I couldn't communicate with Brad while he was in transit back to the States, and I relied on the strength of my family, friends, and church community to carry me as I knew the bottom was about to fall out. Sure enough, when he got back just 24 hours before we were supposed to ship that container, the job, uh, we pulled the plug on the move to Africa because the job had fallen through. We had quit our jobs, sold our house, and many of our belongings. We had a house in Rwanda, our daughter was enrolled in school in Rwanda, we even had two dogs that we had adopted and they were waiting for us over there. <laughs> we were supposed to be commissioned at church that Sunday, but instead we stood in front of the church and told them that we were homeless, jobless, and we had no clue what we were going to do next. We had a garage full of 220 volt appliances and no job, but we had an incredible support system and a sovereign God who, while we didn't understand it at the time, saw this coming and had a plan. Brad did get his job back, but over the next year, we would move three times, get smacked with near financial destruction, and watch our debt skyrocket. Oh, and we had a third kid. No big deal. During that time, we were left with two choices. We could trust that what we had learned about God was true, or we could walk away from the faith completely. Because most of the time, we couldn't see God. But there are some lessons we learned during that dark season. The first is that God's plans are different than ours. I'm not talking about the change of plans where you think you're gonna take this job and you really want it, and then you end up taking this job. Although I've experienced that too, and it can be heartbreaking. I'm talking about the kind of plans where there are open doors and provision and support and a clear leading and you are headed full force down this entirely new direction in life and you are fully convinced and affirmed it's right and out of nowhere the door gets slammed shut in your face. Now I want y'all to listen to me because I know that six months before you graduate you're going to have some thriving church calling begging you to be the teaching pastor out in Dallas or Atlanta or Southern California with a salary package that's going to pay off all your debt you're going to get a month's sabbatical pay for all your child care the staff's going to love you but just in case that doesn't happen I want you to hear me out sometimes God's plans are different and we all know this of course the reality of that is actually much worse when it happens. A change in plans or a closed door doesn't mean that you heard God incorrectly or that you're unfit for ministry. It was tempting for us to think that because it was public and embarrassing. I would meet people for the next three years and when they put the dots together, they'd be like, oh, you're that couple. Yep failed missionaries, right here. You got it. We had several people suggest to us during this time that maybe we didn't hear God correctly or we were trying to do this in our own strength. And I appreciate their concern, but no one else can fully and clearly understand where the Lord is leading you. We very clearly followed the Lord's leading to pursue this move and he very clearly shut the door on this opportunity, period. But that didn't mean that he was shutting the door on us. The second lesson that we learned is we're not always privy to the why, this side of heaven. Everyone wanted an explanation. Well, you shouldn't have tried to move your kids to Africa. Well, you were gonna get pregnant again. Well, safety, well, whatever. But at the end of the day, we didn't know why. And even if we did, it wouldn't have lessened the heartache. Sometimes God reserves the reasons for himself and he is under no obligation to share them with us. But we can trust that it is always for his glory and we learn that, but not until years later. So here we are in Dallas, yay. <laughs> I had prepared my heart and mind to live in the third world and raise my babies as some of the only white children in a developing country. And here I was stuck in Dallas, one of the most materialistic cities in the country. Everything I had prepared to leave was now a part of my reality, and I didn't wanna be here. 
I didn't want to be in Dallas because I believed a fundamental lie about ministry. There's a general perception that international ministry happens overseas and domestic ministry happens here with Americans. I had prepared to do ministry over there, but I was here, so that was a problem for me. But God smacked me in the face and in his sovereignty helped me to realize that he has brought the nations here as a result of education, a global economy, access to transportation, and very unfortunately, world crisis. Here's the third and most critical lesson that I learned. International ministry can happen right here in our hometown, and we are missing a huge opportunity if we fail to see it. So while wallowing in my sorrow about not being in Rwanda, our church began working with the refugee community here in Dallas. My small group started bugging me about it, saying, well, if you wanna do international ministry so bad, there's a lot of refugees who live in Vickery Meadow. And they annoyed me so much. I wanted to be in Africa, not in Dallas. So this went on for a few months, me rolling my eyes at my small group and fighting with God about why we were the only people ever in the whole history of the universe of ministry whose plans had changed. And then something finally wore me down and I started to pay attention. I started to realize that some of the same people groups I was going to live with overseas were living five minutes from my house in Lake Highlands. And the needs were the same. Poverty, lack of education, completely marginalized women. And that's when something clicked for me. And the vision of what would become Vickery Trading Company had room to grow. So I stopped having a pity party. I realized that my passion for ministry hadn't changed. The dust settled and I realized that I still wanted to empower women and there was an opportunity staring me in the face. My prayers changed from, Lord, why? To, Lord, lead me through the process of what if. What if I could help empower marginalized women here in the States? What if I could use all of the preparation for overseas and apply it here in Dallas. Now, like I said, Brad got his job back and out of appreciation for his employer's grace, we knew we needed to stay here a little while and honor that. So I knew I wasn't going anywhere for a while and I've never really been the type to just sit still and do nothing. So I decided to give it a shot. I knew from preparing for Rwanda that I would need what I call a show me skill that doesn't require English to teach or master. For women, sewing is a good fit because it can also be done at home in the midst of juggling motherhood. I started to look for market opportunities in the social business sector and saw a gaping hole in children's clothing. Children's fashion is currently a $70 billion industry and the staggering majority of it is manufactured using unethical practices. This was the opportunity. Now you'd think it would be great to have a fashion or marketing degree for this type of endeavor, but I didn't. I had no fashion experience and no retail experience, except for that weekend job at Bath and Body Works when I was 16. I didn't know how to sew. I didn't have experience with Middle Eastern or Islamic people groups. And somehow this translated in my mind to, I should start a children's clothing company manufactured by refugees in Dallas and teach them English and business smarts along the way. Makes sense, right? Did I tell you I'm crazy? And I may be, but sometimes it takes a little crazy to do something that's never been done. I knew I could fill in the gaps of my knowledge and experience by surrounding myself with a team who had more industry knowledge than I did. What I couldn't do was run away from the fact that God had put in me a desire to serve the most marginalized women in the world. Women who have little to no education and therefore no access to jobs. I have a fundamental belief that women, international people groups, and refugees are co-image bearers with me as a creation of God. I believe that they should all be allowed the dignity of an education and the right to work. Things that you and I take for granted. 
I couldn't run away from the fact that God had put these desires in my heart and then placed an opportunity right in front of my face. Even if on the surface it looked nothing like what I had planned. But contrary to what many of us like to think, it's not our plan. It's God's plan. And it's not our story. It's his story. We're just players in it. So I swallowed a big old humble pill and I started building Vickery Trading. I was terrified. I had no clue what I was doing. We were fresh off what seemed like failure in not moving to Rwanda, and it was risky to do something out of the box in such a publicly visible way. But I just took one step at a time, one meeting, one research topic, one learning opportunity at a time. Now, in the trenches of day-to-day -day startup life, it looked like I was building a social business but the business is just a means to an end. I was building a context for relationships, a place for people to walk through life together and support one another, just like we do with our friends and coworkers. We as Americans and Christians have adopted an almost callous habit of how we respond to people in need. We often respond in a way that communicates, well, let's just give them something, and then we go on with our life. But people in need deserve someone to see past their circumstance and see them as a loved creation of God. They need to be given an opportunity to rise to a level playing field and have the dignity that God breathes into all of us. So at Vickery Trading, we created a place to see past their perceived inferiority and get to know one another. Before long, we realized we have a lot in common. We're all daughters, wives, sisters, friends, mothers. Our common experiences bind us together in a way that goes way beyond faith or language. And instead of one or two hours a week, like in a normal ministry context, we spend about 18 hours a week together. There's a trust and mutual love that grows between you. And that's the context for ministry. That's where you have honest conversations about faith not because they're a project, but because they're my friends. Now, before you start thinking that we sit around all day and drink tea, and we do drink a lot of tea, let me explain what this looks like structurally. This structure builds the context for relationships to happen, as well as many other layers of life change and empowerment. Vickery Trading equips refugee women for long-term success through vocational training, personal development, and fair wages. We train refugee women to sew at a professional level using industrial machines. This allows us to have a competitive product in the marketplace. I'm not into sympathy purchases for the poor refugees. Now, people do buy our products to support us, but our products stand on their own two feet because of the quality of their construction and the skill level of our seamstresses. We produce a children's clothing line, mostly little girls' dresses, and sell them online and at markets as a way to generate revenue that pays their wages and supports our operations. We did over $67,000 in sales last year and just under 12,000 in manufacturing for other brands. How does this sales thing work financially for a nonprofit? Well, you just won't be able to sneak out of chapel early if you wanna find out. <laughs> Next, we spend 25% of each workday in personal development. The number one barrier for refugees in America is English. Their mastery of the language is the gateway to every other achievement they're aiming for in the States. So we focus heavily on English, reading, handwriting, grammar, typing. We also practice English immersion during the workday. They're not allowed to speak their native tongue when they're at work. I've seen women go from no English to conversational English in a matter of months. And while their English skills are empowering, the confidence they gain through these skills is astounding. We also host special workshops like financial literacy or domestic violence awareness. We're equipping women to navigate culture successfully so that they can become self-sufficient, financially independent contributors to our society. We're helping to restore the dignity that was stripped from them in the resettlement process. Now, the last piece of our model is fair wages. We pay a fair rate for the work our women do. We're considered an ethical clothing company. 
The vast majority of the clothes in the world are manufactured in horrible working conditions by people who are grossly underpaid. For me, there was nothing especially ethical about our pay structure. It just seems like common sense to me that a person should earn the wages that are fair for their work. That's countercultural in the fashion industry. For Vickery Trading, it's a decision for us that honors the dignity of a human being and a co-image bearer. Our employment at Vickery Trading is only part-time and it certainly can't fully support a family, but it helps tremendously. Women are able to buy much needed food and clothes for their families. We also put families in a position to buy things like a second car so both of them can go to work, to pay college tuition, or buy a home in a safe neighborhood with good schools. That's empowerment. I get the privilege of offering a woman her very first job. I hand many women the first paycheck they've ever earned because they come from places that say that because you're a woman, you can't work. And you know what? Since you're never gonna work, there's no point in educating you. This is wrong. It is based on a lie about the fundamental value of all humans that God has created. It is detrimental to women, families, and entire economies. As believers, we have the opportunity, and I would dare say the obligation, to fight this injustice with ministries that acknowledge women's value and lift them out of the cage of marginalization. When we step into a woman's life and allow her a way out of poverty by giving her work, which, by the way, she was designed to do when God created her, we are showing her the face of God. Because here's the deal, we can talk about faith all day long, but if we ignore the most basic needs of the people we're talking to, then we're not embodying the gospel, and we're missing half of the greatest commandment, which is to love others. So how do we pull this model off? A lot of help. <laughs> On a daily basis, our office is busting at the seams with volunteers who come and help with English, practice handwriting, run through flashcards. My nine-year-old daughter came in last summer and taught cursive. We had some seventh graders in last week quizzing some of our associates for their citizenship test, which, by the way, I don't think I could pass. <laughs> Others are there to help pin, fold, and tag garments so we can take them to markets or ship them to customers. But again, that's just surface-level activity. What's happening in the process is conversations about life and family that build trust and form relationships. Our volunteers get invited to Arabic dance parties, Afghan birthday parties, Iraqi picnics. Our associates go to our volunteer homes for dinner with their families or go meet them at the park to play with their children. And all of, these, all of a sudden, these people who were foreign and in need become welcome and friends. Our volunteers get to live out the commandment to love and care for foreigners and aliens in our land. And y'all, it's beautiful to watch. So if y'all missed that, that was a plug for volunteers and interns and Agape Projects. We're only 15 minutes away. Our website is victorytrading.org. We just updated the internships yesterday. And DTS knows where to find me. No excuses. Okay, so I'm not naive enough to think that there are no skeptics in here about our financial model. It's out of the box for ministry. While researching ministry overseas and the funding of long-term missions, Brad and I became fully convinced that there has to be an alternative to funding ministry other than full donation support. Giving is declining. Decreased tax benefits reduce incentive for donors. It's just getting harder to fund ministry by donations alone. When we were making a business plan for overseas, Brad and I also wanted to build an organization that would self-fund so that donor dollars could be freed up to be used in other areas of ministry. By building a social business, Vickery Trading is meeting a consumer need, it generates funds for its own operations, it provides 
desperately needed wages for its beneficiaries. And it frees up dollars to be used elsewhere in kingdom work. Victory Trading is fully a 501c3 organization. We're not a hybrid, and we don't currently have a for-profit arm. We do take donations, and we have to according to IRS regulation. Those donations fund all of our educational programs, the childcare we provide for our preschool-aged children, and all the other needs that fall outside of the scope of normal business operations. We're working towards sustainability, and when we're there, everything else will be funded by the sale of clothes. This is a different model for ministry, especially for those of us who are formally trained in ministry. But it is a legitimate business option that can give you access to people that you might not otherwise have access to. Now you've heard, my mention, heard me mention my husband, Brad, here and there throughout the talk. He's pretty incredible. He'll go to lunch with a banker or a ministry leader and they'll ask how Vickery Trading is going. They'll ask what we're doing with it right now. And he laughs to himself and gently corrects them, clarifying that he actually doesn't have anything to do with the day-to-day. -day. His role with Vickery Trading is being a dad when I have a board meeting or a weekend market and to earn enough money to solely support our family while I'm building this company. The original plan was that Brad would run the business side of the company in Africa and I would build the discipleship model. This is actually pretty hilarious if you know us because we both have our THM and we both have corporate experience, but I'm the organized leader type and he's the relationship builder. <laughs> so our grand plan for Rwanda really would have just ended up with lots of tension and a lack of fulfillment in our roles. It wouldn't have worked. <laughs> when the move fell through, <laughs> he's over there nodding, um, it's very true. When the move fell through, Brad returned to his corporate job in the banking industry. And y'all, he loves it. He's realized that this is how God wires him and he is fully engaged in ministry in a corporate role. But this is where the game-changing decision came in, for our marriage and for Vickery Trading. He actually said to me, y'all are gonna like this, be sure and tell them that more men need to be supporting women in ministry. <laughs> Told you he was good. Now as far as this social business dream goes, Brad went from a position of leadership to a position of fully support and no decision-making power. That takes a humble man. Now, I'm not gonna pretend that this transition was easy for us. I wasn't exactly the docile, quiet type before Vickery Trading, but as the Lord was crystallizing this vision in my mind, I'm like ready to go. And Brad had to make a conscious decision to move out of the way and let God do his thing. Brad came to a place where he recognized how God made me and gifted me and chose to support me in that no matter what. No matter what it looks like. And sometimes, a lot of times, it looks like dishes and laundry and cooking and making grocery lists and taking the kids to the watermark tree fort so I can prepare a talk for DTS Chapel. Because when he reads scripture, he sees me as a Holy Spirit gifted co-image bearer that has a call on her life that is equally as valid as his. And there is no way that I could be CEO of a fashion company and executive director of a nonprofit if he wasn't fully on board with the path that God is taking us down. So I wanna encourage you again that God's plans may look different than you thought, even opposite of what you thought. But if you are in the center of that plan, you and your spouse and everyone involved will be more effective for the kingdom. You will be blown away by what he can do. And here's what he's doing with Vickery Trading. After about 18 months in the program, our women graduate from Vickery Trading and we help them launch into the next phase of life. We have some that we've brought back in staff positions, and they're learning how to interact directly with American businesses through man managing manufacturing accounts. One of our women used her paychecks to pay for English classes at Richland College when she was in our program, and now she's a full-time college student pursuing a degree. 
Another is launching her own fashion line. Another went to work for a local company as a seamstress, earning twice as much. Because of our deep investment and care, they feel the tangible results in their life. They know that we have their best interests in mind, and we, they trust us. And this allows us to maintain an ongoing, long-term friendship with them, giving us the opportunity to minister to them for years. People have asked me if I'm glad that we didn't move to Africa. And my answer is adamantly, no. It was one of the most horrible heartbreaks to endure. There are many times I still wish we could have gone. But God has given me the gift of why now. If we hadn't walked right up to the edge of that move to Africa, I never would have been prepared to do what I do today. I'm not sure I ever would have studied the marginalization of women or impoverished people groups as seriously as I did. I wouldn't have dug into what works and doesn't work in a social business. I wouldn't wish our heart-wrenching experience on anyone. But I also can't say that I'd change anything about it. If there is anything that I can leave you with today, any piece of wisdom for ministry, it would be to go. Go boldly down the path the Lord is taking you. Even when it's crazy, even when it's out of the box, even when it's hard and sad and complicated, go. Think outside the box. Go against the normal and expected. Push the limit of what has been done in ministry and you might just stumble into something amazing and be a part of some incredible work for the kingdom in that place. Even if it looks like doing dishes. Y'all come and visit us at Vickery anytime. Thank you. <laughs>